It was a pretty uneventful evening in 1991 when an officer called John saw a car driving quite recklessly down a highway in Rochester. The officer followed that car for a short time before signalling for it to pull over. Once it had pulled over safely to the side of the road, the officer got out of their car and walked to the driver's side of the vehicle and then he asked the person in the vehicle what his name was. The man said he was 40-year-old business owner Charles Grande. He didn't really have a reason for why he was driving so recklessly and so went on to apologise. And then he talked to the officer for quite a while, saying about his landscaping business, and Charles was really personable and witty. And he actually managed to charm the officer into letting him off. But the very next morning, officers were called to an address where a body had been found. The body had been identified as that of Charles Grande, the man who had been pulled over just a matter of hours beforehand. The problem was that this man had been dead for well over 24 hours. The man who had called himself Charles Grande, the one who had been driving Charles's car, was actually someone else. And police didn't know it yet, but that man had actually murdered three people and he was going to murder a fourth. This is Red Rum. Stories about the true victims of crime. I use news archives, documentary footage and books to research these cases and so the episodes are accurate to the source material I can find. You can find all episodes as a YouTube or podcast version in the description down below. Investigator Tim Partington was assigned to investigate Charles's murder. He made his way to the apartment block on Lake Avenue and went inside of the apartment and that is where he found Charles lying face down on his bedroom floor and he had extensive trauma to his skull and this had likely been caused by a hammer. Investigator Partington was also struck by just how warm the apartment was when he arrived. He realised pretty quickly that the thermostat had actually been turned all the way up. Because of this, the body had started to decompose at a pretty rapid rate. It was clear Charles had been dead for over 24 hours, but they couldn't really get an accurate time or even date of death. All the officer knew at this point was that this was very clearly a homicide. Investigator Partington began speaking to um, a number of potential witnesses and he came across a man called Alan Streeter. Alan had seen someone driving away from the crime scene the night before Charles's body was found and they were driving his car. Investigator Partington thought this was probably the same person who had been pulled over in Charles's car and who had impersonated him. So it was important to him at this point that he needed to get an accurate description. The investigator showed Alan a set of six photographs of men who fit the description who might be of interest. There was only one of these men that Alan responded to and he pointed to and said very specifically that the man driving the car had a skinny neck and he was pretty sure that it was the same man in this photo. He'd seen him driving away from the crime scene. The man in that photo was Robert Spahalski. Robert Spahalski was born alongside a twin brother, Stephen, in Elmira in New York back in 1954. By the time he was 15, he was already deep into rebelling against the system, specifically getting himself a pretty extensive criminal record. He was caught stealing a car, as well as setting fire to an area of a high school. It was during this year, in 1971, that his brother Stephen was arrested for murder. Stephen was just 16 years old when he killed 48-year-old Ronald Ripley. Stephen claimed that Ronald had tried to sexually assault him and so he'd ended up beating him to death with a hammer. This wasn't just a case of defending himself from a rapist though. And I should say that we of course only have Stephen's version of events because Ronald is dead. We don't know how true his version is. But after he had hit Ronald with that hammer, he then went on to repeatedly stab him with a knife. All in all, Ronald suffered 47 wounds. It's reported as well that Robert was present during that murder that was committed by Stephen. And at one point it was even thought that he could have done it and he was taken in as a potential suspect. However, it wasn't long before Stephen admitted to the murder and so Robert was let go. Of course, we know that Robert was well into the criminal world and that he had stolen that car aged 15. So by the time Stephen had been taken into prison for that murder, Robert was also spending time in prison. In fact, he was sentenced to spend every weekend for four months inside a prison. That was the sentence he got for stealing that car. 
Two years later, Robert broke into a music store and he stole lots of equipment as well as over $3,000 in cash. He was caught and he was found guilty and sentenced to five years in prison. This would be his first real stint in prison full time, but he actually only ended up spending around two years there before he was released. The very next year, however, he broke into a high school and he was caught and arrested and sentenced to two to five years, so he was back in prison. During one of these prison stints, Robert was actually placed in the same facility as his brother Stephen. Whilst they were inside, the brothers managed to make a deal with another inmate who was working on some kind of official vehicle. The plan was that Robert would hitch a ride and he would hide in the vehicle and escape the prison that way. However, one of the inmates who had heard of this plan tipped officers off and Robert was caught. Now, because Robert and Stephen had looked so similar and they'd sort of helped each other in this escape attempt, the officers weren't actually able to identify who had been the one who had tried to escape. And so ultimately, they were both um, given sentences in solitary confinement. So they were given more time added onto their sentence and they were kept in solitary. In November of 1979, Robert was released from prison and it was the very next year that he managed to actually find himself a job and he was working for the city of Rochester as a mechanics assistant. It was in July of 1981, that Robert convinced his friend Roger to help him rob this coin collection and it was worth a lot, it was worth over $35,000. To them, this was huge money. If they could pull this off, then they'd be set for some time. But much like most of his crimes, Robert was clumsy. He forgot to do certain things and it wasn't long before he got caught and again was sentenced to two to five years. But this sentencing did not reflect how much time he actually spent in prison. He was out after three months, and this is when things really got bad. He then had a couple more prison stints before 1991, when he was identified by Alan as being that man in Charles's car driving away from the crime scene. Now, alongside this identification by the witness, the investigator also went to visit the man, the officer, who had pulled Charles over, or the person who was impersonating Charles over on the highway. He had a sneaking suspicion that this was the same person, of course. And so investigator Partington showed the officer six photos of men matching the description he'd given. The officer immediately identified one of these men as having been the man who was in the car, in Charles's car, who had said that he was in fact Charles Grande. This photo was, unsurprisingly, of Robert Spahowski. They tracked Robert down and initially they arrested him for criminal impersonation and also for criminal mischief. He was then brought in for questioning relating to Charles's murder, but he just told them that he had nothing to do with it. Yes, he'd taken his car and yes, he pretended to be him, but it was a coincidence that Charles had also just been murdered on the same night. Unfortunately, the investigating team didn't actually have the evidence to charge Robert with murder, but they were able to charge him on the impersonation charges. So he was taken to Monroe County Jail to await trial. But ultimately, a grand jury decided not to indict him and he was let go. And then in July 1992, Robert was sat on a bridge in downtown Rochester and he saw two officers pull up beside him. It was 10.20 p.m. and it was dark out and the officers just sort of came up to him and they started trying to make conversation with him. He was quite hostile towards those officers and pretty much straight away he brought up that he really didn't like police and he spoke about the murder and the previous robbery charges. He said he thought they were just out to get him for no reason. The officers decided Robert was acting shady and they decided to actually detain him in their car while they ran a criminal record check. They found out who Robert was, but after they were satisfied that he hadn't actually done anything illegal that evening, they let him go. The interaction worried Robert though. He was watching over his shoulder pretty much constantly, continuously worried that he was going to get caught. But he wasn't so worried about getting caught for the murder of Charles. He was more worried that the police would ask him about the murder of Moraine Armstrong. Back in 1990, Robert was having sex with various different sex workers. And in December of 1990, he'd been engaging with 24-year-old Moraine Armstrong. There's not a whole lot of information on Moraine. I know that she was born in October of 1966 and that she had various clients before Robert. 
It was sometime between Christmas and New Year that Robert decided to murder Moraine. She was found on the 31st of December and she was found in her apartment in Lake Avenue. And what was curious about the scene was that she was wearing one sock. This is something that became a kind of signature of Robert. She also had electrical cords wrapped around her neck and it was later determined that she had died by strangulation. Robert had used the electrical cords from a wire to end her life. The death was violent and it was personal. Investigating officers conducted a neighbourhood check and they interviewed as many witnesses as possible. One officer was stood outside of the apartment block when Robert approached him. Robert asked what was going on and the officer explained that there had been a woman in this apartment block and she'd been found murdered. The officer told Robert it was Moraine who had been killed and asked if he knew her. He said no. Even though he lived in that same apartment block, he did not know her. He'd never even seen her before. And with no reason to suspect this seemingly friendly neighbour who just happened to be passing on his way back to his apartment, Robert was again let go. And it was possible that he actually believed that no one would ever find out that he had any kind of a connection to Moraine's murder. It was in July of 1998, so it's around seven years after he's murdered Moraine, that Robert was just walking down uh, North Clinton Avenue in Rochester, and he kind of sensed that there was someone behind him. And when he glanced back, he saw that there was a patrol car pulling up and stopping just a few feet from him. The police officers exited the vehicle and made their way over to him. Now, at this point, Robert was sure that his time was up. He'd been living as a free man for years and they surely were here to arrest him. Maybe for Moraine's murder, maybe for Charles's murder, or maybe they knew about the third murder. Around seven months after he'd killed Moraine, Robert struck again. It was summer and the sun was burning hard and that warm temperature meant that the smell coming from an apartment on Emerson Street was probably more noticeable than it would have been in the cooler months. It got so bad that a neighbour had called in to police to report the stench. Officers soon arrived at the Emerson Street residence and they found that there were hundreds of black flies swarming around outside. That, along with the horrific smell, meant that the officers felt it was absolutely essential to break in and see what was happening inside of the apartment. When they managed to get inside, they found the badly decomposed body of 35-year-old Adrian Berger. The problem was because the apartment had been so warm and the body had decomposed so rapidly, it had actually gone way past the point where they could identify what had been the cause of death. And the reason Adrian's body hadn't been found for a fair few days was because Robert had taken her car keys and he'd driven her car and parked it a few blocks away. He parked it far away so that he hoped the neighbours would assume that when they hadn't seen her for a few days, she'd just gone off on a trip somewhere. Now, what the investigators didn't know was that Robert and Adrian had been having sex on the sofa when he, quote, snapped. Robert would later say, quote, I don't know why this has happened. It's a mental problem I have. I started choking Adrian. He strangled Adrian to death, taking four to five minutes to kill her. And he only stopped when he noticed tiny little yellow pinpricks in her eyes. Because Adrian's cause of death was unable to be determined straight away, it was not initially labelled as a homicide, it was labelled as undetermined, the cause of death. Still, the officers investigating decided to talk to neighbours around um, Adrian's place that she was living and also family members and see if there might be anyone useful that they had seen, anyone looking suspicious, anyone leaving Adrian's place. And they did speak to a neighbour who had seen Robert leaving Adrian's place. The neighbour didn't use Robert's name, they didn't know him, but he said he had seen this person before and when presented with a photo sheet of six different men matching the description, he pointed to one person and unsurprisingly, that one person was Robert. The officers also found Robert's fingerprints in the apartment and so they did interview him, but he told officers that of course they'd found his fingerprints. He was Adrian's on again, off again boyfriend, but he didn't really have anything else to say to them. He hadn't seen Adrian in days, and the last time he saw her, she was absolutely fine. And that case had been cold ever since. 
So then we shoot back to 1998, six years after that murder, and Robert's at the side of the road. Those two police officers have pulled up to him. They've got out of their vehicle. And this is just incredibly worrying for Robert. He was absolutely sure they were about to arrest him. His crimes had finally caught up with him. It was 8.40 p.m. and the two officers approached Robert and they asked him who he was and he told them. And then he added that he was in drug rehabilitation and he was not into, quote, hurting people. But the officers weren't here about him hurting people. That's when one of them then asked him a question about a camera. They were investigating a stolen camera that was allegedly being sold in the area. They thought from the description given it might be Robert, this man standing in front of them, but it wasn't. And for the first time in his life, he actually wasn't guilty of a crime he'd been accused of. And so although they did question him, once they realised he wasn't the perpetrator, they left him, let him go free, and he went on his way. And Robert would spend the next few years in and out of different apartments. He um, he started selling drugs and sort of just back in the criminal lifestyle and he developed a severe addiction to crack cocaine. He would continue selling drugs and also do sex work in order to pay for this cocaine habit. It wasn't until 2005, so a full 14 years after that last murder, that Robert would strike for the final time. He would later say that it was having smoked so much crack cocaine that he went to see his friend Vivian. Um, friend, lover, the reports are kind of uh, blurry on this. But he had smoked so much crack cocaine that he saw her morph into a demon monster right in front of him. With this transformation, he said he knew she needed to be taken care of and so he strangled her right there. When he came to, he said he very much regretted it. And so he pulled Vivian's body into his bathtub. All of this has happened in his apartment. And once Vivian was in the bath, he bathed her and then he wrapped her up. And then he dragged her down to the basement of the apartment block. He spoke about how he would periodically go down to the basement to visit Vivian's body. And while he was there, he would allegedly cry and tell her how sorry he was. I'm not sure how believable this is. Look, I don't know. Of course, I don't have any extra knowledge or extra information that others haven't reported on. But what I do know is that he dressed Vivian in one sock, which is the same way he dressed Moraine. This is a signature. I can't see another reason for it. If he was truly distraught and remorseful about Vivian's death, then why is he making his signature sock move on her. Either way, it was four days after the murder that Robert arrived at Rochester Police Station and told the person at the front desk that he needed to talk to a homicide detective. The officer at the desk asked Robert if he had an appointment and he said no, but that he needed to confess to a murder. Robert initially confessed that he had killed someone he'd been doing drugs with, but that he was high and he didn't remember it. He told officers they could go to his house and search it and they would find the body there. The only thing he asked for at this point was that he did not want to be present during the search and he would later say that was because Vivian was his friend. Killed his friend, but his friend. During the interview, Robert told officers that he suffered from PTSD and he took medications for it, but he didn't have them with him. So the officers agreed that they would go and get him the meds. And that is when Robert told them he also heard voices. And he would later say that the voices were something else that had sort of forced him to kill Vivian. But his story would change quite a lot. And once it was clear that Robert really wasn't going to say anything else about Vivian's murder, one of the officers in the interview room decided to change the kind of course of the interview and ask about Charles Grande. Throughout the previous couple of hours, the investigating officers who had been in that interview room had been in and out of the room asking questions, but also gathering uh, background information on Robert. This included his previous arrests and things he'd been involved with and so they knew about Charles Grande and they wanted to get him to admit that he had killed him. It seems that by this point Robert was pretty much sure that he was going to be in prison for a very long time and so he actually admitted that he did murder Charles and he provided officers with a written and verbal statement. They then went on to ask Robert about Moraine and he responded asking if Moraine was the woman on Emerson Street but he'd messed up. The woman on Emerson Street was Adrian. 
And now police knew he had some kind of connection to her and most importantly, some kind of connection to her murder. He quickly confessed to Adrian's murder soon after that, but he continued to deny any involvement in Moraine's murder, saying that he didn't even know who she was. He was then shown a photo of Moraine and he said he might recognize her, but he wasn't sure. Now, I don't know how relevant this is, but this detail really struck out to me because I don't think I've ever come across someone like this, a really cold-blooded killer who then asked this question to the police. Robert told police officers that he may be able to remember a little better if he was allowed to meditate. He needed to have some time and some space to do that. And so the investigators allowed him some alone time. And when they eventually returned, he was still sitting there in, in the center of the room saying that he was having trouble remembering but he asked if Moraine's murder had had anything to do with an iron. The investigator confirmed that yes, an iron had been used, and that is when Robert eventually confessed to the murder, saying that the two of them had gotten into some kind of argument after um, they had had sex, and she said that he owed her money for sex. Robert said, quote, she just got stupid, and so I choked her. The officers initially didn't really understand why Robert had so easily confessed to the other murders, but not Moraine's. But Robert later told them he didn't want to be a serial killer. Now, he had wrongly assumed that in order to be classed as a serial killer, you had to kill more than three people. But the FBI's classification is three victims over three different incidents. So the murders that he'd already confessed to already meant that he was going to be classed as a serial killer. And there were a number of unsolved murders that had happened in the time that Robert had lived in the area. And so investigators took a look into them as well. And although there was a whole lot of strong uh, suspicion that Robert was involved in a number of these deaths, there just unfortunately wasn't the evidence to prove it. And Robert never confessed to any other crime, so he's never actually been convicted beyond the ones he's confessed to. In 2009, Robert's brother Stephen was finally released after a 30 year prison sentence. Now, that 30 years wasn't actually for murder, by the way. The murder charge that he got, he was released after just eight years, but he was soon back in prison because of this armed robbery that had happened sometime after his initial release. So now, after 30 years of that sentence, he was finally released. But this time, he didn't stay out for long. Again, he was so. Uh, heavily institutionalized that the reality of the outside world was just not something that he could cope with and so he was back in prison uh, a short while later. The fact that two twins committed murders separately has raised this conversation about nature versus nurture, whether there could have been something in the twins' childhood that somehow turned them into murderers or because it's just in their blood, it's in their DNA, they are programmed this way. But there isn't a huge amount of information either way, really. There's not a huge amount of information on their upbringing. All I could find was some little bits of sort of contradictory info. So it's hard to narrow down what exactly happened in their childhood. But either way, there wasn't anything brought up to suggest that there was any kind of um, abuse or sort of connection that made them this way, that made them into murderers, which is something that's been suggested by some reporters. Stephen even did an interview once where he spoke about his connection to Robert, and he would speak about this sort of twin, twin telepathy thing, but he said that he actually had no idea that Robert had killed anyone until he'd been brought into prison after he'd confessed to those crimes. Even though Stephen had been the first of the pair to murder, he was completely oblivious to Robert's murderous tendencies. And the pair thought very differently about their crimes too, at least to an outside eye. Robert was outwardly, at least, very remorseful, whereas Stephen was not. He continues to this day to speak on how the murder that he committed was justified and it was just something he had to do. Stephen even spoke on Robert's victims, saying that they must have deserved it. There must have been, quote, good reasons for these four people to die at the hands of his brother. Stephen truly is one of the most vile humans on the planet. 
I think that's clear. And I feel a bit odd saying that about Stephen and not Robert, although I think Robert is pretty vile as well. But just the way that Stephen talks about the crimes after them, it's clear that all of that time he spent in and out of prison, it's done nothing to help him reflect or be remorseful in any kind of way. Thank you for joining me for this episode of Red Rum. I uh, I watched the new M. Night Shyamalan film. Um, I've been so excited about it and it's called uh, The Trap or Trap um, and I've been so excited about it because I watched the trailer and all of this is in the trailer, there's no spoilers. It's basically about this man who goes to a concert, he takes his teenage daughter to a concert and while he's there, there's a very heavy police presence that he notices. And he realises that the authorities, the heavily armed SWAT teams, all of the police officers, they're here to capture someone called the Butcher. And we learn that the Butcher is this serial killer who's been capturing people and then chopping them up and he's been getting away with it for some time. This whole concert, we learn, is a trap to capture the butcher. We quickly realise that the butcher is this main character, the man we've been following, the dad who's taken his teenage daughter to this concert. The rest of the film follows him as he tries to find a way to escape, all whilst not revealing to his daughter what's going on. Oh, I think the premise for this film was so exciting. It has so much potential and I love M. Night Shyamalan. Um, I think all of his films are, even if they're a little far-fetched, or weird, they're always um, surprising and interesting and feel super fresh. And this film definitely felt like that as well. It's interesting and it's far-fetched and it's a bit weird. And I have to say, I didn't love the ending. I felt like it was maybe a bit um, anti-climatic in a number of ways, but I think it is surprising as a film and I love the sort of concept of it. And a lot of what they did with it was great. Overall, I'd give it maybe like a 6.5. I'd say it's definitely worth a watch if you're an M. Night Shyamalan film fan. Um, but yeah, I would love to hear what you think if you've seen it or if you go on to watch it. Other than that, I'll see you next week for another episode of Red Rum. Bye. <laughs>